بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم فاللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا ووفقنا للعمل فيما يرضيك عنا بجاه نبيك الأكرم صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وسر أسرار الفاتحة Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace and blessings upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad on his blessed household, his loyal companions and all of those who followed after him with excellence up until the day of standing. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Thereafter, uh, the adab and the effects and the blessings of Ramadan that we spoke about in the first uh, session were adab and etiquettes and mannerisms and effects and blessings of Ramadan that are reaped by a believing person internally. Right? Those are the spiritual benefits of Ramadan. But what we have to remember is that the spiritual benefits of Ramadan do not come about except through uh, us adhering, do not come about except by us adhering to the outer mannerisms and adab and etiquettes of the sunnah of the Prophet The Prophet he done certain actions with his physical body, right? And there were certain actions that he did with his blessed heart and with his blessed soul. So there are certain aspects which are internal to do with the spirit and certain that are external to do with the body. In Islam, both work hand in hand. We have, even amongst Muslims, we have those who think that it's only about the outer actions and there's no spirituality to our religion. And then we have those uh, who say it's only about spirituality and there's no outer actions. Both are wrong, categorically wrong, absolutely wrong. Imam Malik defined the people of truth and he said, من تصوف ولم يتفقه فقد تزندق ومن تفقه ولم يتصوف فقد تفسق ومن جمع بينهما فقد تحقق Imam Malik ibn Anas Imam Dar al-Hijrah رضي الله عنه he said the one who wishes to attain or thinks that he can attain inner spirituality without adhering to the outer laws of our religion will end up reaching kufr, disbelief. Why? Because this person will negate the outer action. This person will say, oh you don't need to stand up and pray, you can just sit down and make zikr all the time and say Allah Allah all the time and that's enough. You don't have to stand up five times a day and pray. And guess what? They give dalil from the Quran. They say Allah said in the Quran, Wala dhikrullahi akbar, that the remembrance of Allah is the greatest. Remembrance of Allah is the greatest in accordance to what Sayyidina Muhammad said, not what in accordance to what you think and perceive. Is that clear? So Imam Malik said, the ones who want to attain spirituality without adhering to, to the outer laws of this religion, they will reach kufr, disbelief, by negating the, the, the laws of Islam. And those who concentrate upon the laws of Islam, the rules of Islam, without having a spiritual aspect to that, right? they will reach fisk, they will reach major sins. They will reach major sins. Now, what type of people are they? Remember Imam Ghazali said that there's three categories of people who fast. The first category of people who fast uh, is like the student who comes into school and just has the register tick, learns nothing, concentrates not, and then fails the year. Right? These are the type of people who only adhere to the outer laws of our religion and don't want to obtain the inner spiritual side. What will happen to them is even if they are fasting, they will end up in fist in major sins. Why? Because they'll fast and they'll benefit 
anything from their fast except al-ju'u wal-atash, hunger and thirst, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Is that clear? So Imam Malik radiallahu anhu said, those who seek spirituality without adhering to the outer laws of Islam will reach kufr. Those who uh, seek the outer laws of Islam without uh, having a pursuit for inner spirituality, they will reach major sins. And those who gather between both, outer laws of Islam and inner spirituality of Islam, فَقَدْ تَحَقَّقْ They have reached. They have reached what? Reality. Haqiqa. They have reached reality. They have reached the utmost truth. Is that clear? So we are people who adhere to the outer sunnahs, the outer ways, the laws of Islam. And by adhering to the outer laws, we build our spirituality. It's not the other way around. We don't build spirituality upon outer laws of Islam. We don't say, oh, I'm a spiritual person and I do this particular type of zikr and that's enough for me. It doesn't work like that. Why? Because what we could have seen of the Prophet وسلم, was his outer nature sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that clear? And we learn that by looking at his outer nature, we will build our inner spirit. Is that clear? Like the story we mentioned a few days ago, that a man, a student came to visit a great wali of Allah, a great friend of Allah's. He came to visit him in his zawiyah, in his madrasa. He had, the student had heard, this great wali of Allah, he has enormous miracles, mashallah, lots of karamat. He said, let me go and look at these exciting karamat, exciting uh, miracles. He came, he stayed in the madrasa for a few days after meeting the shaykh. And then he packed his bag and said, you know what, forget this, nothing yet. No miracles, nothing. As he was walking away, the shaykh saw him and stopped him. He said to him, son, you came, you met us, you didn't speak and now you're leaving. He said, shaykh, I came, I had heard you were a great wali of Allah. I thought I'd, I'd see some miracles, some karamat, right, that will excite me. I didn't see anything. The shaykh smiled and said, come with me, son. He sat him down and said, son, from the day that you arrived to this moment, from the day that you arrived to this moment, think of my day and night, i.e. the day and night of the shaykh, and think of the day and night of this entire madrasa, and tell me if you saw anything which was not in compliance with the sunnah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the student sat and he began to think, when I came, it was this time. And how were the people behaving here? Day and night he thought. He said, well, I've been here for three days. I didn't see anything which was not in compliance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The shaykh said, that's the biggest miracle. To live our lives in accordance to the life of Sayyidina Muhammad ﷺ is the biggest miracle that any Muslim can attain. And upon that, he was pleased, the student. Upon that, he was content. We have to know what a miracle is. You know, in Arabic, the word for miracle is karama. And the word karama comes from what? It comes from ennoblement. Right? It comes from ennoblement. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ennobles his servant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives honor and ennobles his servant. One of the great scholars of Damascus who migrated from Algeria to Damascus, Sayyid Muhammad al Hashimi radiallahu anhu. Sayyid Muhammad al Hashimi radiallahu anhu, one of the great scholars of, of Islam. One day he was walking on a beautiful day in a park with some of his students. And amongst them was a very simpleton student, a very sada student. And he said to the Shaykh, he said, Shaykh, show me a miracle. He said, Shaykh, show me a miracle. Very simple. And the Shaykh said, continue walking and you shall see the miracle. The Shaykh said to him, continue walking and you shall see the miracle. So he continued walking with the Shaykh and they reached the other end of the park and Sayyid Muhammad turned to that simpleton student and he said to him, did you see the miracle? Did you see the miracle? And the student said, Sayyid, I didn't see anything. Maybe the miracle went beyond me. What was it? And the Shaykh radiallahu anhu listened to what the Shaykh said and we will realize what the awliya radiallahu anhum deemed to be miracles, not what lay people deemed to be miracles. 
not what people of uh, people who don't have knowledge deem to be miracles. Listen to what the awliya deem to be miracles. Radiallahu anhu. Sayyid Muhammad al Hashimi radiallahu anhu said to the student, he said, Son, did you not see that we walked from that end of the park to this end of the park and Allah's earth did not swallow us up due to our sins? He said, Allah has ennobled us and allowed us to walk upon this earth. This is the greatest karama. This is the greatest miracle that Allah allows us due to our, uh, regardless of our sins. Allah overlooks our sins and He allows us to tread upon His earth. Jalla Jalalu. He said, this is the greatest karama. This is the greatest miracle. One of Sayyid Muhammad al-Hashimi radiallahu anhu, top students, a great faqeed, a, a, a Hanafi jurist, Shaykh Muhammad Sa'id al-Burhani radiallahu anhu. Our teacher Shaykh Ali Khalsa mentioned to us that again another person came to say, uh, Shaykh Muhammad Sa'id al-Burhani radiallahu anhu, the great Hanafi jurist and a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person came to Shaykh Muhammad Sa'id and said, Sayyidi, tell me of a miracle that you have. Tell me of a karama that Allah has given you. Right? So we don't know what he was expecting. Maybe the Shaykh said that, you know, I touch money and it becomes millions. Yeah, I touch gold and it increases. Something like this. He asked the Shaykh, tell me of a miracle that you have. And Shaykh Muhammad Sa'id, uh, Shaykh Muhammad Sa'id al-Burhani said to the student, he said, son, I don't know of any other miracle except that Allah allows me to pray Fajr in the masjid every day. He said, son, I don't know of any other miracle except that Allah allows me to pray Fajr in the masjid every day. And the student said, Shaykh, come on, tell me of a miracle. He said, tell me of a miracle. And he said, son, this is all that I have. All, this is all that I have. Now the person who asked the Shaykh, he said, when the shaykh told me the miracle that Allah had given him, I belittled it. And I didn't deem it to be a miracle. And I was punished due to that, that I was not allowed to pray Fajr in the masjid for an entire month. And when I realized, I made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I sought forgiveness from the teacher. See what karamat are, what miracles are. Imam ibn Atayullah al-Iskandari radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest awliya of his ummah. He has a book known as Al-Hikam, Wisdoms. They say his wisdoms are so wise, his wisdoms are so wise, so profound, so concise, so eloquent, that the scholars of Islam have said, if we were allowed to recite anything other than the Quran in prayer, then we would have been allowed to recite the wisdoms of Ibn Atayullah. If we were allowed to recite anything other than the Quran in Salah, then we would have recited the wisdoms of Ibn Atayullah. What does he say in, his, in one of his wisdoms? He says, Al istiqamatu ilmul karama. He said, To be steadfast, to be steadfast upon this religion is the essence of every miracle. The essence of every miracle is to be steadfast upon this religion. So if someone says to you, so and so flies in the air, ask them where they pray Fajr. If someone says, so and so walks upon water, ask them, did they go to sleep with wudu at night? If someone says, so and so can turn dust into gold, ask them how much Quran they recited in the day. If someone says, so and so can blow upon food and it will increase, ask them how many days they fast in the year. Karama, ennoblement, is following the footsteps of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know Imam al Bukhari, Imam al Bukhari radiyallahu anhu, Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Bardizba al Jufi Maulahum al Bukhari radiyallahu anhu. He said, I saw a dream. What did he see? Do you guys see dreams? Yes. Ask Allah for a dream like the dream of Imam al Bukhari. He said, I saw a dream in which I saw Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger of Allah, walking. He said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walking. And I was behind him. 
And the Prophet did not raise his foot, except that I put my foot in exactly where he had raised his foot from. The Prophet did not raise his blessed foot, except that I placed my foot exactly where he had raised his foot from. He said, I saw this in my dream. When I woke up, I interpreted, the interpretation of that dream was that Imam al-Bukhari is following the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam exactly and intact. This is the greatest karab, to be ennobled in following, in adhering to the outer ways, sunnahs of the Prophet wasallam. So by these outer that we can build up our spiritual. Is that clear? We build our spirituality through the outer actions that we do, not vice versa. No, that's the wrong way. Is that clear? The way of Islam, the true way of spirituality in our religion is that we increase in our outer de good deeds so that our inner spirituality enhances. Is that clear? So that our inner spirituality enhances. Not that we speak about inner spirituality and we have no good deeds. Is that clear? So in the first uh, session we spoke about the spiritual levels that a believing person can reach by fasting. Now we will speak about the actual fast itself. We will speak about the actual fast itself. Is that clear? From a uh, fiqhi uh, point of view, from a uh, from the jurisprudence side of uh, fasting. Okay. So the Fuqaha radiallahu anhu have said the definition of a fast in accordance to jurisprudence is to refrain from food, drink, and fulfilling one's desire from the time when Fajr enters till Maghrib time. From the time that Fajr enters till Maghrib time, this is the definition of fasting. And of course, we spoke about that this is the most basic uh, and the most simplest form of fasting. This is the ba most basic and simplest form of fasting. But upon this we have to build to become uh, people of righteousness and have fasts of righteousness. The conditions of it, its obligation. Is fasting an obligation upon everyone? Is it an ob uh, obligation upon everyone? So what type of people is fasting an obligation upon? Or what conditions are necessary to be found in a person before fasting is an obligation upon them. The first point is that fasting is prescribed for Muslims. Islam is a condition to fast. So if you're at work, Mr. Asif, you don't go and tell all of your non-Muslim friends in Ramadan that you need to fast. Why? Because they're not Muslims. And someone who has not entered into the fold of Islam, someone who has not entered into the fold of Islam, then the branches of Islam don't apply to them. What are the branches of Islam? The root of Islam is the Shahada. The branches of Islam are the actions. Is that clear? So someone who doesn't have the root is never going to have the branches. Is that clear? That's number one. Number two is maturity. To have reached the age of puberty. So young children, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Right? Young children who have not reached the age of maturity, fasting is not an obligation upon them. But nevertheless, parents should encourage their children to fast. Parents should encourage their children to fast. But in that, again, they have to be sensible. In that, they have to be sensible. So for example, when Ramadan is in winter, the days are extremely short. You know, you close your fast in the morning, say about quarter to seven, and four o'clock the fast opens. That's like a school day. All they have to miss is lunch. They have breakfast, they come back home and have a late lunch and you're done. So in winter, children should be made to fast throughout Ramadan. Well as in long days of summer like now, children should be encouraged to at least fast in the days that they attend school. At least fast in the days 
that they don't attend school or fast odd days, fast a day, miss a day. Is that clear? So that they can take from the blessings of Islam and they can be trained into fasting. Because young children who are not trained into fasting, you know when they reach the age of maturity, they won't fast. I've seen this. I remember when I was at the masjid, kids who were 14, 15, they weren't fasting. And you know the excuse that they were giving? Oh, my mom and dad said, don't fast, it's too much for you, you go to school. The parents are making their children miss a fard and enter into haram because they go to school. Schools are important, but not as important as the fard. School is important. Schooling is important. Education is important. The first word that was revealed in our religion was iqra, read. One of the early revelations was nur wal qalam wa ma yasmurun. Allah swore by the pen, the means of learning, right? Education is important, but we have to prioritize things. When a child reaches the age of maturity, their parents must instruct them to stand and pray their five daily prayers, must instruct them to fast, but they can only instruct them at that time if they have encouraged them beforehand. And we know that the Prophet said, uh, teach your children prayer whilst they are at the age of seven. Uh, sorry, order your, instruct your children to pray. Instruct your children to pray at the age of seven. Strike them upon it at the age of ten if they do not pray. Right? And our teacher, Sheikh Samir al Nas, explaining this hadith, he said, why strike them at the age of 10? What's the significance about the age of 10? He said, when a child reach, reaches the age of 10, that's when his ego, his nafs, begins to mold and build. At the age of 10, when the parent says to the child, do this, the child says, no, I don't want to do that. The child feels that I have an opinion also. So to uh, bring out this opinion, they can be struck, but gently, so that this child knows that sometimes we can't have our way, and we have to have the way of our parents and the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that clear? Right? So children must be encouraged from a young age to fast. And even if they are not fasting due to young age, then children should be taught the adab of Ramadan, that they should not eat in front of other people. That they should not eat in front of other people. For example, elderly people, elderly people who are quite frail in their bodies, who are not well on medicine, they can't fast these 18 hours, right? They need to take the medicine and things like this. Are they allowed to sit in the open amongst their families and eat? No. They should sit in secret where no one, where no one who is fasting is around and eat. Is that clear? I visited one of my teachers, one of my elderly teachers, and he said to me, son, I take medicine four times a day. I can't hack 18 hours of fast, so I will make up my fast in the shorter days of winter. Is that clear? Likewise, children who are not fasting must be taught the adab of Ramadan, that even if you do not fast, you are not allowed to eat in the open. So they don't go to the chip shop and buy a bag of chips and eat in front of their friends. Is that clear? That's number two. Number three, sanity. To be sane. Someone who is immature, i.e. they don't have their mind, they don't have their brain, uh, they're not sane, fasting is not an obligation upon them. Is that clear? And number four, good health. Good health. Now what does good health mean? Good health means that a person's body can hack. A person's body can hack the fast of the day. So if someone is extremely old, if someone is extremely old and their bodies are extremely frail and they can't go without food and the doctors have told them you can't go without food, then they are excused from fasting. They are excused from fasting. This type of elderly person is known as a shaykh al-fani. In the books of fiqh, they are described as a shaykh al-fani, the elderly person who is approaching their end. An elderly person who is approaching the end. One. Secondly, there might be someone who's young, but on a hospital bed, 
and with some drips on them. And the doctors say these drips have to stay on this person, otherwise they will dehydrate and die. Again, this person is exempt from fasting. Once they have good health, they can fast. Or, uh, you are fasting during the month of Ramadan, and it catches up on you, and someone gets extremely ill. Now, when we say extremely ill, that doesn't mean you've got a, a bit of a migraine, a sore head, a sore throat, um, you know, vomiting, or some diarrhea, and that's it. You say, you know, I'm not fasting for the day. No. This is petty. When we say that good health, it means the opposite is such that you cannot in any circumstance hack that day of fast. Is that clear? And people need to strive. If you feel hungry, guess what? Ramadan is so that you feel hungry. If you're starving at the end, at Maghrib time, that's the purpose of Ramadan. Don't wake up the next day and say, you know what, I'm not fasting because I was starving yesterday. That's exactly the purpose of Ramadan, that you starve, that you go thirsty. You know Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, you know, one of the most beloved things to me is to fast on a baking hot summer's day where I feel so thirsty. He said, this is one of the most beloved things to do. Why? Going thirsty and hungry for the sake of Allah. Going hungry and thirsty for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I hear this often, you know, I wasn't feeling well, I didn't fast today. It's disgrace. Next uh, is that the absence of menses and postnatal uh, bleeding. So during the month of Ramadan, there will be uh, days in which uh, women do not fast. Uh, likewise, women who have given birth do not fast. Again, the same ruling applies. The same ruling applies that those women who are not fasting, no one in their house should know that they're not fasting. They should wake up like everyone else at Sehi time. And they should sit at the table like everyone else at Iftari time. Right? And during the day, if they need to eat, they should eat in secret. So that no one in their house knows that this person is not fasting. And okay. Alhamdulillah, this is, the, uh, this is the way of the Muslim household. That if there is a woman who is not fasting, no one knows about that. They conceal that. Is that clear? And of course, these fasts have to be made up by those uh, women. The women do not have to make up their prayers because that would be too difficult for them every month making up so many days of prayers. But fasting comes once a year, so the fasts that are missed, they must be made up. Next. Major ritual, being clean of major ritual impurity is not a condition of being allowed to fast. So what does that mean? So if someone wakes up in the morning, let's say Sahih time ends at, I don't know, what time does it end? What time will it end this year? Uh, let's say at uh, half to quarter to three. Let's say Sahih ends at 2.45. Let's say Sahih ends at 2.45. Someone wakes up at uh, 2.14 and they have five minutes left. And they see that uh, they had a wet, wet dream or they had relations and they are in a state of major ritual impurity. And they don't have enough time to go and have a bath and make ghusl and purify themselves. Can they fast that day? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. So being in the state of major, being pure from major ritual impurity is not a condition of fasting. Is that clear? Even though, listen to this, even though it is from the adab of fasting, it is from the etiquette of fasting that those who are, are approaching a fast of the next day and they, they, they are in a state of major ritual impurity that they wake up beforehand in enough time to perform ghusl, to have sahri, and then close their fast. This is the adab. But what if someone oversleeps one day? What if uh, someone oversleeps and it's 3 o'clock and the fast closed 15 minutes ago and they wake up and they find that they are in a state of major ritual impurity? 
Can they fast that day? Yes. All they need to do is make their intention and fast. And then, after making their intention and fasting, they perform ghusl. But when they perform ghusl, they should not exaggerate in uh, putting water in their nose or in their mouths. Why? Because if they exaggerate, if they exaggerate in putting water in their nose or mouth and that water goes into their body, they would have invalidated their fast and they need to make that up. Is that clear? Likewise in wudu, when we perform wudu in Ramadan, we should not exaggerate in putting water in our mouths and in our noses. But this point is extremely important. People often miss their fast because they wake up and think, oh, you know what, I'm in a state of major ritual impurity, I'm not going to fast for the day. This is wrong. Next, residence. To be a resident, i.e. not to be a traveler. Someone who is traveling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the traveler an option. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the traveler an option that if they wish, they can fast and that's better for them. And if they wish, they can miss out that, that fast and make it up after Ramadan. Why is this? Because traveling is difficult. Even in, the, in our times of uh, extreme comfort, it's still difficult. You know, if you have to sit on a plane for even four hours, it's tiring. Right? And then when you get off at the air airport, you have to travel for another two hours to get home, it's tiring. Right? This is why it said that uh, traveling is a qita'atun min al-azab. It's a portion of punishment. Right? Traveling is a portion from punishment. It's difficult. Sometimes, at the beginning it seems exciting, but when you go through, you, you, fatigue gets to you and tired them. So someone who is traveling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused them and allowed them to make up those fasts later on. But if they fast and choose to fast in the month of Ramadan, that will be better for them. Why? Because it's easy to fast when you know everyone around you is fasting. Number one. And number two, it's easier to fast when the shaitan is locked away rather than when he's opened up. Is that clear? But nevertheless, Allah has given this allowance. And finally, the final condition of fasting is intention. Intention and niyyah. For each day. Now this needs explanation also. People say, I woke up at Sahih time. I had my meal. Sahih time ended and I forgot to make a niyyah. I forgot to make a niyyah. Right? There's a few things here. There's a few things here. The fasting of Ramadan, the fasting of Ramadan, the intention, it is not necessary for it to be made before Fajr. What does that mean? So someone who wakes up for Sahih and has their Sahih food and then makes intention, that's good, that's fine. And that's the original way. That's good, that's fine, and that's the original way of making intention at second time. But what if someone oversleeps and second time has finished and it's fajr time, they're gonna miss out on food. But guess what? Food is not a component of fasting. Right? People think, because I didn't eat, I can't fast. No. Right? So if you wake up late and you wake up at fajr time, what do you do? You wake up and you make intention, you say, Oh Allah, I intend to fast this day. And that's it. You're done. That's it, you're done. So the fasts of Ramadan, intention can be made before Fajr and can be made after Fajr. But you can't eat after Fajr. So you can't say, someone wakes up for second time and starts eating. And second time ends and they're still eating. They've invalidated their fast. But if they stop eating at Sahih time, and then Fajr time comes in, and then they remember, I didn't make an intention, and then they make the intention, that's fine. Is that clear? So the intention can also be made after Fajr time. And intention must be made for every day, right? An intention, it's not necessary that the intention is uttered with your tongue. The intention is in the intention of the heart. So long as you intend in your heart, I'm fasting today, that's it, it's done. But if you intend with the tongue, it's also recommended 
and beneficial to remind ourselves. Is that clear? So those are about seven or eight conditions to be fulfilled for the person who wishes to fast. Then the scholars of Islam spoke about the different, different types of fast. The different types of fast. You have a fast that is fought. Like the fasts of Ramadan, they are fought upon uh, the people who, have, uh, who, who, who fulfill the preconditions. All of these preconditions that we have mentioned, someone who fulfills those preconditions, the fasting of Ramadan is fought upon them. Is that clear? Then you have uh, wajib fasts. So if someone uh, takes a vow, takes a vow and says, I will fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this particular day that becomes wajib upon them to fast. Likewise, if someone is uh, fasting a nafal fast, a sunnah or a nafal fast, and they break that fast, are you allowed to break your fast if you fast in nafal? No? Are you sure? Okay. There is one reason why you are allowed to break your nafal fast. It's an exciting reason. Right? If one day, you feel extra pious and you wake up at second time, you have a big meal and you say, I'm going to fast today. And then at 9 o'clock in the morning, you have some visitors come to your house. 9 o'clock in the morning, you have some visitors come to your house. And you have to serve them breakfast. And it's not nice that the host is fasting and the guests are eating. Right? They will feel shy and they won't eat. So the scholars have said, in this state, you are allowed to break your fast so that you don't break the heart of your visitors. You are allowed to break your fast so that you don't break the heart of your visitors. This is only for Nafal, not in Ramadan. Right? But that fast that you have broken, right, to accompany your visitors, now it becomes wajib to make up that fast. Now it becomes wajib to make up that fast. Another example of that. Another example of that is if you are praying nafal, if you are praying nafal prayer and your mom calls you or your dad calls you, the scholars have said you break your nafal prayer and you attempt to the call of your mother and your father. Not, to, not for the fat prayer, only for the nafal prayer. If you are praying a nafal prayer and your parents call you, you break your nafal prayer and you attempt to the call of your parents. Now that nafal prayer becomes wajib for you to make it up. Is that clear? So what is the rule? The rule is, the rule is, if you start a nafal action, a voluntary deed, if you start a voluntary de deed and then break it halfway through, that voluntary deed turns into a wajib act that must be made up. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tubtilu a'malakum. Allah said in the Quran, O believers, do not nullify your actions. Do not nullify your actions. And anything that you nullify, then it becomes a wajib to make it up. Is that clear? Okay. Likewise, another type of fasting is the Sunnah fasts. So for example, fasting on the 10th of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, is a Sunnah fast. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina to Munawwara, he saw the Jewish community of Medina fasting on the 10th of Ashura. He inquired, why do they fast? Why do you fast on the 10th of Ashura? And the Jews of Medina, they said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam from Fir'aun on the 10th of Ashura. The Prophet fasted on the 10th of Ashura and he said, لَإِنْ عِشْتُ إِلَىٰ قَادِمٍ لَأَصُومَنِ الْدَاسِحِ If I live till next year, I shall also fast the 9th of Ashura, the 9th of Muharram. Why? Because I have greater right over Musa alayhi salam than they do. My relationship to Musa alayhi salam is greater than their relationship to Musa alayhi salam. Why? Because all of the prophets are brothers. All of the prophets are brothers of one family. Shall I tell you a story of all the prophets being brothers of one family? Who's heard of Addas? 
ليس عن ابن عباس
Are you going to wage war against the same man that I presented those grapes to? And they said, yes. And Adas said to them, well, listen to me, that even if you had the mountains on your side, you would never be able to defeat him. Even if you had the mountains on your side, you will never be able to defeat him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is that clear? Why did we mention Sayyidina Abdas? Because of Musa Alayhi Salam and the relationship that the Prophet وسلم, had to all of the Prophets. Right? And the Prophet said to Abdas, huh? uh, You come from the lands of Yunus ibn Matta, the Prophet of Allah. And he said, How do you know Yunus Alayhi Salam? He said, We're both Prophets and we know each other. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would fast on the tenth of Ashura. Likewise, from, and then another category of fasting is uh, fasting on the middle three days of every month, known as the white days, a yamul bil, the white days. Why are they called the white days? Anyone know? Because because of the full moon, the radiance of the full moon makes it a white day. Is that clear? So what are the white days? The 13th, 14th and 15th of every month. The 13th, 14th and 15th of every month. And guess what? 1400 years later, the scientists have worked out that the, the highest levels of crime happen in these three days. Why? The highest levels of crime happen in these three days. Why? Because the human nafs is at its highest peak in these three days. The human nafs is at its most aggressive nature in these three days. And look at the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. To suppress that human nature, fast on the three days of uh, the middle of the month. Is that clear? Likewise, fasting on the Monday and the Thursday is from uh, the recommended fasts. And likewise, fasting the six days of Shawwal after Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, من صام رمضان وأتبعه بست من شوال فكأنما الصام الدهر كله. The one who fasts in the month of Ramadan and then follows up that fast with six days in the month of شوال, it's as if he has fasted for the entire year. As if he has been fasting for the entire year. This is one. And another thing that the scholars have mentioned about the six days of شوال is that. People should make intention to fast for the six days of Shawwal and try their utmost. Why? To fast for the six days of Shawwal. Why is this? The scholars have said, if you do a good action, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to follow up that good action with another good action, then see the second, see the second to be the reward of the first. See the second to be the reward of the first, number one, and see the second to be the sign of acceptance of the first. So, if you pray one prayer and Allah allows you to pray the next prayer of the day, see that second prayer to be the sign of acceptance of the previous prayer, right? To, see, to be the sign of acceptance of the previous prayer. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Man kana akhiru kalamihi min dunya la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. The one whose final statement in this world is La ilaha illallah before they die, they should enter into paradise. Why? Because that La ilaha illallah will be an indication that what came before in the life of this person was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that clear? So fasting in the six, the six days of Shawwal is also of importance. And then people have a choice whether to fast them straight after Eid, whether to join them or spread them in the month of Shawwal. It's best to fast them straight away. Why? Because you're still in the habit of fasting. And likewise, from the recommended fasts are fasting in the month of Allah, in the month of Muharram. In the month of Allah, in the month of Muharram. The Prophet said, the best fast after Ramadan is the fast of Allah's month, Muharram. And the best prayer of, after the obligatory prayer is the prayer during the night. So the best fast after Ramadan is the fasting of Muharram. And the best prayer after the obligatory prayer 
is the fast uh, is the prayer of tahajjud and then other than these fasts that are recommended from the sunnah to fast any other day is nothing is absolutely voluntary voluntary is that clear is absolutely voluntary and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the best of fasts is the fast of my brother Dawood alayhi salam. He would fast one day and miss a day. Fast one day and miss a day. Fast one day and miss a day. Right? This is the most balanced of fasts for the people who can attain this. Right? People who don't reach that level, then they can fast. Start by fasting once a week. Choose either a Monday or a Thursday and fast once a week. And then increase it sometime later and fast Monday and Thursday. And then sometime later, increase it, if you have the ability, to the three days of the middle of the month. Is that clear? And then if you have ability, sometime later, then fast one day, miss a day, fast one day, miss a day. Is that clear? And the scholars of Islam differ upon whether people are allowed to fast every single day of the year. Every single day of the year, which is known as Sawmuddah. So the fasting of all time, right? Uh, most scholars say it is not recommended and people should not fast every single day of the year. Reason being because this will weaken them from their duties and responsibilities. Nevertheless, the high ranking only are the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can balance between both, right? It's allowed for them. It's allowed for them. Like for example, Imam al-Nawawi, Abu Zakariya Yahya bin Sharaf al-Din al-Nawawi radiyallahu anhu, one of the greatest imams of this ummah, he would fast every single day of the year. He would fast every single day of the year. But when at Imam al-Nawawi, right, he would only eat once and drink once. He would eat after Isha and drink water once at the Hajjul time, Sahih time, and that's it. Is that clear? So we shouldn't jump to the people who we can't reach to. It's like Shaykh Hamza says, uh, people look at Sahih al-Bukhari and say, you know what, I can't be hey, like, uh, look at Imam al-Bukhari and say, I can't be like him, let's forget it altogether. No, you start things gradually, don't jump from the top because you're going to break your neck. Climb from the bottom and you reach. Is that fair? Climb from the bottom and you reach the top. But if you're going to jump from the top, you're going to break your neck. Then, the scholars have mentioned, there are two types of fasts which are offensive, which should not be uh, approached. Number one, which is slightly offensive, makrut and zihan, lightly disliked, to fast the, the tenth of Ashura, the tenth of Muharram all alone, without fasting the ninth before or the eleventh after. Right? So this day should uh, be joined on to a day before or a day after. Likewise, fasting on Friday alone. Likewise, fri fasting on Friday alone. Why? Because Friday is the day of Eid. And the Friday is the master of all days. So we should not distinguish Friday and fast on it all alone. If we fast on Friday, we should match it with uh, Thursday before or Saturday afterwards. Is that clear? Likewise, Saturday. Likewise, Saturday, we should not single out Saturday alone also. Is that clear? Then you have a type of fast which is severely offensive, makru tahriman. And that is fasting the first day of the two Eids. Fasting the first day of the two Eids. Small Eid and big Eid. Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha. Is that clear? This is highly makru, tahriman. And something which is makru, tahriman, it is very close to haram. And some scholars did not distinguish between haram and makru, tahriman. Like Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani, radiallahu anhu, one of the great jurists and mujtahid imams, and one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he used to say, Al makru tahriman huwa al haram. Makru tahriman is haram. There's no difference. Why is it why is it highly offensive and makru tahriman to fast on the two on the days of the two Eids? 
Because the day of the two Eids are the days in which the banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is spread. Allah is the host and everyone is the guest. So imagine you go to someone's house on Eid day and they present the most beautiful of foods to you and you turn around and say, I'm fasting. That's offensive, isn't it? Likewise, if someone offers you a gift and you say no, that's offensive. Is that fair? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a gift on the two or eight days. And if we deny, how do we deny it? By fasting on those days. But rather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the two days of Eid, they are ayyam aklin wa shurb. They have days of eating and drinking. The Prophet didn't say this about any other days of the year, except the two days of Eid. He said, ayyam aklin wa shurb, days of eating and drinking. And you know the greatest of awliya, the greatest of the friends of Allah, you will see them fast all year round, except on the days of Eid. Why? Because on the days of Eid, they are sitting at the, at the banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you make the most of it. And when you eat on the day of Eid, you think this is from the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you eat from the generosity of a generous, you should fill your stomach and eat. You should fill your stomach and eat. You all know the story of Imam al-Shafi'i radiyallahu anhu, don't you? Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan, sorry, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i radiyallahu anhu. Imam Muhammad ibn Idris, I always mention the names of these Imams so that we memorize them. Is that clear? They are our honor, they are our dignity. And inshallah, they will be our savior on the day of judgment. People learn the names of football players. What for? Stars on television. What for? They are stars in front of your face and they live 50 lives behind the screens. Learn the names of imams whose internal and external, whose private and public was clear who are true men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By saying their name, Imam Sufyan radiallahu anhu said, عِنْدَ ذِكْرِ الصَّالِحِينَ تَنْزِلُوا الرَّحْمَةِ When you mention the name of a righteous man, Allah's mercy descends from the heavens. Right? Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu went to visit Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Ahl sunnah radiallahu anhu. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal had told his whole family about this great Imam, Imam al-Shafi'i. They told him stories about the great Imam al-Shafi'i And they were all excited and uh, anticipating and waiting for Imam al-Shafi'i to turn up so that they can see him. Excitement. And Imam Ahmed had a young daughter. She was also waiting to see Imam al-Shafi'i. And you know, young kids, they are very observant. Very observant. You say anything in front of them, they'll repeat it like this. They'll say it exactly the way you say it, and even better. And sometimes you might say something wrong, and they repeat it, and you say to the child, where did you learn that from? From you. <laughs> it's like Sheikh Hamza says, you know, children are very innocent. Where did they learn lying from? From their parents. And he tells the story of that kid who the parent, someone knocks the door and the parent says, go and say, dad's not at home. Right? The, parent, the child goes to the door, opens the door and says, dad said, say I'm not at home. Absolutely innocent. Right? So they're very observant children. Uh, be very careful as to what you do before them. And what you say before them. Because they will pick up you. This is why the greatest teachers that anyone has, our parents and the most influential children, the most influential parent, uh, sorry, the most influential teachers are parents. And parents shouldn't forget the, the the amount of influence their words have on their children. They are very powerful. I know parents who don't speak to their children, their children feel an emptiness in their hearts and feel a loneliness and a vacuum within them. Is that clear? So Imam, Imam Ahmad's daughter was watching this man, Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu. 
and he came to the house and Imam Ahmad laid out an enormous banquet for him. And Imam Shafi tucked in and he ate to his fill. And then after that, when night struck, Imam Shafi lay down and he slept till Fajr. And she was watching him all night, this young girl. She saw that Imam Shafi woke up. He didn't even make wudu and he, standing up, he stood up to pray. He didn't even make wudu and he stood up to pray. The young girl went to her father, Imam Ahmad, and said, Dad, are you sure this is the same Shafi you've been talking about? And he said, yes, daughter, why? And she said, well, I saw that you, i.e. Imam Ahmad, I saw that you ate only a little and he ate to his full. Number one. Number two, I saw that you slept only a little and you stood and prayed at night and he didn't pray. And number three, the, the worst of them is that he slept all night and he prayed Fajr without wudu. And Imam Ahmad said, daughter, let's go and ask the Imam. So the young girl posed all the three questions to Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu. And Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu replied to the young girl and said, daughter, this is the first day in my life that I have eaten to my food. And the reason why I'm, I have eaten to my food today is because I know this is the food of a righteous person. And the food of a righteous person is cure for the heart. The food of a generous, righteous person is cure for the heart. That's number one. Number two, your father slept little and prayed at night. I lay down, but I did not sleep. When I lay down on the bed, one mas'ala of fiqh came to my head. I uh, solved it and another one occurred in my head. I solved it and another one occurred in my head. I solved it and another one occurred in my head up until the time that Fajr entered and I stood up and I prayed Fajr with the wudu of Isha. I stood up and I prayed Fajr with the wudu of Isha. Is that clear? So the two days of Eid are the days in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generosity is flowing upon the people so they should sit and eat, not fast. Number three, the fast of continuity. Sawmul Nisal. We know the Prophet وسلم, would fast for days on end. So at Maghrib time, he wouldn't open his fast, he would connect it to the next day. And then connect it to another day. The Sahaba, عنهم, they saw the Prophet do this. And they thought to themselves, you know, the Prophet has no sins, he's absolutely pure. If he is fasting like this, then how should we be fasting? And some of the Sahaba began to fast this fast. And the Prophet وسلم, summoned them and called them and they, they asked them, I hear that you are fasting the way I am. And they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, we see you that you fast days on end. And listen to the reply of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Lastu kahayatikum. I am not like any one of you. Rabbi yuti'imuni wa yasqini. I sleep at I sleep at I sleep at night and my Lord gives me food and drink. And my Lord gives me food and drink and nourishes me. So constantly fasting days on end without breaking the fast at Maghrib is also highly offensive. And also, number four, to perpetually fast such that the fast stops a person from their responsibilities and their duties towards themselves and others is also highly offensive. Some of the female Sahaba radiallahu anhunna complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that some of their husbands were fasting all day and standing in prayer all night. Fasting all day and standing in prayer all night. The Prophet summoned these companions and they said exactly the same. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we saw that you are absolutely pure from sin. And you are not only the forgiven one, but the one through whom Allah will distribute forgiveness. And we thought 
that we are not like you, therefore we should fast even more, and we should stand all night. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, Ana akhshaakum lillahi wa atqaakum lah. I am the most fearing of Allah from all of you, and I am the most knowledgeable of Allah from all of you. Asumu wa uftik. I fast and I miss out days. Usalli wa anam. I stand and pray and I sleep. Wa atazawwajul nisa. And I have relations with with my spouses. So the Prophet ﷺ was trying to indicate to them that reaching piety is, is not by you making up your own awrad and wazaif and timetables, but rather reaching piety is by following my footsteps. So someone who perpetually fasts such that they become weak from their family responsibilities, from responsibilities towards the duties towards themselves, this is also highly offensive. Is that clear? Uh, and also, number five, uh, a woman should not fast, a voluntary uh, fast, except with the permission of her husband. A woman should not fast, a voluntary fast, except with the prior permission of her husband. Is that clear? اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وفقنا للعمل بما يرضيك عنا بجاه نبيك الحكم صلى الله عليه وسلم بسم الفاتحة Incorrectly, 
when we do something incorrectly, or when we nullify a prayer or a fast. So for example, if we nullify our prayer, what's the expiation for it? That we make it up again. Is that clear? That we make it up again. Likewise, there are certain types of people or a certain type of fast or a certain type of way in which people break a fast that require for that person to make up the fast and also give expiation or make expiation. Is that clear? <clears throat> That's number one, category number one. And then we'll speak about it. Number two, those that require a makeup without expiation. So there is a certain type of people when they break a fast in a particular way, they must make up that fast, but they don't have to uh, make up. Uh, they don't have to do expiation for that. Number three, those that require nothing and are not disliked. So certain things within the fast that people might think this breaks my fast, but it doesn't. Is that clear? And number four, those that require nothing yet are disliked. So there are certain acts that are uh, that break the fast and require expiation. There are certain acts that break the fast but don't require expiation. Then there are certain acts that don't break the fast, and then there are certain acts that don't break the fast but are still disliked. Four categories. Category number one. Category number one. Those that require a makeup as well as expiation. What is it that if we do it during Ramadan, we would have broken our fast, we would need to make up the fast and give an expiation? They are the following. If someone eats or drinks, if someone eats or drinks something that is normally eaten and drunk for nourishment, Right? Someone eats normal food and normal drink, that's one. two. Someone eats or drinks, number three has uh, relations with their spouse, three things. Someone eats, drinks or has relations with their spouse during the day of Ramadan and they do this intentionally. Not out of forgetfulness, they do this intentionally. They have broken their fast. They need to make up that particular day of fast and they need to give, they need to do an expiation for that. Why do they need to do an expiation? Because they have violated the sacredness of Ramadan. They have violated the sacredness of Ramadan. When someone violates the sacredness of Ramadan, they must give expiation to clean themselves up, to clear that. Is that clear? So what is the expiation for such a person who eats, drinks, or has uh, relations intentionally during the day of Ramadan, they have to make up the day. And what's the expiation? The expiation is, number one, either they free a slave. You know, back in the days, people had slaves, right? And slaves, depending on the quality of your slave, the slave could be expensive or cheap. Is that clear? So if the slave uh, was very intelligent and he could read and write, it'd be expensive. Or if your slave was a hard-working slave who had, uh, he had handcrafts with him, he could do things with his hand, he was a carpenter, he was a, a plumber, whatever, he'd be expensive. Right? Or if you had a slave who was good for nothing, then he'd be cheap. But nevertheless, he'd be your property. You'd have to give up a slave uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this would be expiation. Is that clear? And just a note here, when we speak about slaves, one of our teachers, Sheikh Mustafa al buha one of the great Shafi'i Fuqaha, he said, I visited him in his, in his house in Damascus and he said to me, I was giving a lecture in, in Qatar, in a university, and there were some foreigners also there and non-Muslims from the West. And one uh, lady asked me about slaves in Islam. And I said to her, we are, uh, we are pleased and honored in the way we treated slaves. We've got nothing to hide. And he said, I said to her, the way we treated slaves in Islam is better than the way people are treating free men and women today upon the earth. Do 
you know how Muslims treated slaves? One of our teachers, he said that our grand teacher, Shaykh Abdul Razak al Halabi rahmatullahi mentioned to him that most of the great reciters of the Quran al Kareem, those who transmitted the Quran al Kareem to us through their chains of narrations, were slaves. Which means what? That we gave slaves the highest opportunity of education. We gave slaves the highest opportunity of education. Right? Slaves never complained in Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed people that they treat slaves the way they treat every other person within their household. So they clothe their slaves the way they clothe themselves. They feed their slaves the way they feed themselves. Is that clear? And Islam encouraged people to free slaves. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned high rewards for people who free slaves. And for certain uh, violations of uh, sanctity of the religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us for the expiation of those violations to free slaves. And one of them is that if someone breaks their fast intentionally through during the month of Ramadan, the first thing that they must do to expiate is free a slave. How many of you got slaves in your houses? No one, no one has a slave today. So what do you do? Then you go to the next category. But you start from the first category of slaves. If you don't have a slave, then you go to the next category. If he does not have one, if you do not have a slave, then what's next? To fast two consecutive months. To fast for 60 days consecutively. Right? And which months do you choose? You have to choose two months in which there isn't Ramadan and there isn't Eid. Because on Eid day you can't fast. Is that clear? Yeah. So fast two consecutive months. What if someone knows that they can't fast for two consecutive months? Two months every day, fast today, fast tomorrow, 60 days. What do they do next? If he is genuinely unable, then he must feed 60 poor people half a saw of wheat or its equivalent in money to each person. Half a saw of wheat to each of the 60 people. How much is half a saw? Right. Uh, the same as what we pay for Sadaqat al Fitr. You know, Fitrana on each day what you give, which is usually they say £2.50 or £3. This is the minimum that you can give. And the more you give, the better it is. So to give, uh, say, £3 or £2.50 to 60 poor people. 60 poor people who do not, who are not eligible to pay zakat. Is that clear? Now, a man came to the Prophet wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, during the month of Ramadan, I intentionally broke my fast by having relations with my wife. The Prophet wasallam said to him, the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a case is that you free a slave. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm the poorest person in Medina. I don't have a slave. The Prophet ﷺ said, Therefore, uh, if you cannot free a slave, then fast for 60 days. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I couldn't fast for one day. So I'm not going to fast for 60 days. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, OK, if you can't fast for 60 days, then feed 60 poor people. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I can't feed myself. How am I going to feed 60 people? The Prophet ﷺ said to him, well, sit down there. Now here the scholars mention those three rulings were the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the legislation of Allah. The Prophet could have said to him, well tough luck, this is the ruling of Allah, duh, duh, duh. if you can't do it, I can't help you. But no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-mukhtar. Al-mukhtar. What does al-mukhtar mean? The one who chooses. The one who has the choice. Allah has given an ikhtiyar choice to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is number one. Number two, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has made him al-mushabri' the one who legislates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute and the ultimate legislator. But with the permission of Allah azza wa jal, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also legislates. So here, 
the legislation of Allah was that he frees a slave. If he cannot, he fasts for 60 days. If he cannot, then he feeds 60 people. After that, the legislation of Allah stops. That's when the blessings and the mercy and the generosity in the legislation of the Messenger of Allah begins. The Prophet said to this man, he said, sit down. He sat. A short while later, another man came into the presence of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, with a basket of dates. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is for charity. And he left it with the Prophet And the Prophet said, where is that man gone who, who, couldn't, who couldn't feed 60 people? And he said, here I am, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet said to him, carry this basket and go and feed the poor people of Medina al Munawwarah. The man carried the basket and he walked off. He left from the presence of the Prophet As he turned away from the presence of the Prophet he realized, he realized that there was no one more poorer than him in Medina and his household. He turned back, he said, Ya Rasulullah, by Allah, there is no family more poorer than my family in Medina. The Prophet legislated for him again. The Prophet said, take this basket and go and feed your family and that will be your expiation for violating the fast of Ramadan. Is that clear? So what do we learn about the, about the rank and the authority of the Prophet وسلم, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him al-mushadda, the one who legislates, the one who chooses for his ummah. A man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'll become Muslim, but I don't have time to pray five times a day. I've got hard work to do in the fields. I'll pray twice. The Prophet said to him, become Muslim and pray twice. Become Muslim and pray twice. This person became Muslim. He went away that he was going to pray twice a day. For some time he went away and he used to pray twice a day. A short while later, some days after he came back and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I can't not pray five times a day. I have to pray five times a day. Why? Because the blessings of those two prayers were so much and he found them so much that he gradually moved up to five. This was the generosity and the authority that Allah gave to his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that clear? So someone who breaks their fast intentionally by eating, drinking or having uh, relations, they must make up that day after Ramadan and they must expiate by either uh, feeding a slave, feeding, uh, fasting for 62 two months consecutively, 60 days, or feeding 60 poor people half a sah of meat. Nevertheless, what if you eat or drink during the day out of forgetfulness? So you're fasting and you walk through the kitchen and there's, a, there's some fruit in the basket and you pick up a banana and you peel it and you eat all of it. And you, you was totally forgot that you were fasting. No expiation, no making up. The Prophet said, Innama Allah. Rather it was Allah who fed you. So forgetting and eating in Ramadan is even a blessing. Why? Because that's the food that has come directly from Allah for you. Is that clear? And then what if uh, you're in the kitchen and you see your brother come to the basket and you know that he's eat, fasting, pick up a banana and peel it and about to eat it. Should you tell him that you're fasting or shouldn't you? The scholars have said, if the person is young and strong, you should inform them that you're fasting and remind them. If it's an elderly person, you should hide away. Right? If it's an elderly person, you should hide away. Is that clear? So that was the first category. Category number two, those that require a makeup without expiation. Those that require a makeup without expiation. Now the general rule in this category is concerning eating and drinking that if someone eats or drinks something that is normally not eaten or not drunk, eats or drinks something that is not normally eaten or drunk, then their fast will be broken, they will have to make up that fast but without an expiation. So let's take an example, I don't know, uh, someone eats some soil, 
someone eats some sand or some soil. We don't normally eat sand or soil for nourishment, right? But someone eats sand or soil in Ramadan. Their fast is broken, but there's no expiation. Is that clear? Medicine comes in the first category. If someone has medicine intentionally during the day of Ramadan, then they will have to make up that fast with expiation. Medicine is something that we normally have. Is that clear? But something like earth, dirt, right? Uh, if someone eats that during Ramadan, their fast will be broken. They will have to make up their fast, but without expiation. Likewise, if someone is making wudu or ghusl during the day of Ramadan, and when they put water into their mouth, they accidentally swallow water, or water goes through their nose into their throat accidentally, their fast is broken, they will have to make up that fast after Ramadan without expiation. Is that clear? Yeah? This is why the scholars have said, in Ramadan you should not exaggerate in washing out your mouth and your nose, in fear that you might break your fast. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, another thing that breaks the fast but without expiation is someone puts a gun to your neck and says, eat this cake or I'm going to kill you. Right? And you break your fast. You will have to make up that fast without expiation. So if someone forces you to break in their fa in your, uh, your fast, right, corners you uh, and uh, poses a threat to you if you do not break your fast, then your fast uh, will be broken, but without expiation. Is that clear? Is that clear? What if you're asleep and someone comes and plays a trick on you and pours a jug of water? Uh, your mouth is open and pours a jug of water through your mouth and you drink it. Your fast is broken but without expiation. If he would have broken your fast for you, you make up your fast after Ramadan, but you don't have to have expiation. Is that fair? And finally, if someone forces themselves to, to, to vomit, vomiting, naturally vomiting does not break the fast. Often people think, oh I vomited, I broke my fast. No. If you naturally vomit, it does not break your fast. But if you put your fingers down your throat and make yourself vomit, this breaks your fast. You have to make up that fast without expiation. <coughs> so those are the first two categories. The first category is eating, drinking, uh, having medicine, having relations intentionally during Ramadan breaks the fast and necessitates expiation. Category number two, uh, someone who uh, uh, takes water in whilst making wudu accidentally, someone who is uh, forced to break their fast, someone who makes themselves vomit, uh, someone uh, down whose throat water or food is shoved, right? their fast will be broken without expiation. Is that clear? So the first two categories. Category number three. Those that require nothing are not and are not disliked. So there are certain things that don't break the fast and nor are they disliked. Number one, cupping. What's cupping? It's known as hijab. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he would perform hijama and this is that he would have blood taken out from his back and from different places of his body. Uh, what happens is uh, people who are certified in doing this, what they do is they make slits, right? They make slits uh, on a person's black back and then they have a special cup, right? Like a glass that they put onto those slits. And what happens is uh, blood, extra blood which is in the body or blood which is, which has become uh, Ill, Ill blood or filthy blood in the body that comes out, right? And by this blood coming out, the body becomes active again. The body becomes strong and active again. 
and there are particular sunnahs of this, there's particular days that this should be done and a particular way that it should be done in. And if you want to do it, make sure you get it done by someone who has a certificate and someone who knows the sunnahs of performing hijama. And it's a cure from many illnesses, right? So, hijama is allowed in Ramadan for those people who feel that it will not weaken them in their fast. But if you feel uh, that by losing this blood, your body will become weak, then you should not perform hijama during the days of Ramadan. Number one. Number two, using the miswak and the tooth stick. Number two, using the miswak and the tooth stick is absolutely fine during the day of Ramadan. Again, a person should be wary and careful that if the tooth stick is wet, that uh, the water from it does not go into their throat. Also, you are allowed to use your toothbrush, but it's uh, to refrain from toothpaste. Even though some of the scholars have said it's fine to use toothpaste too, right? But others have said it's best to refrain from toothpaste because its uh, particles can easily enter into the throat, right? And it will be more difficult for a person to verify if those particles have entered or not. So either use an empty toothbrush or a miswak to, to brush the teeth, this is fine. Uh, number three, rinsing the mouth and the nose without any water proceeding down the throat. So someone who in wudu rinses their mouth and nose, this is also fine, as long as they do not exaggerate to such an extent that water gets to the throat. Finally, placing a wet garment on one's body. So in hot countries, when it's severely hot during Ramadan, it's fine for a person to wet a, uh, a, a towel or a garment and put it over their body to cool their body. This is fine. It doesn't break their fast, nor is it makul. Is that clear? So that was category number three. Category number three. No. You should refrain from mouthwash. You should refrain from mouthwash. The way you refrain from toothpaste, likewise you should refrain from mouthwash. Finally, those that require nothing yet are disliked. Yet are disliked. Number one, if one tastes some food or chews on it without swallowing, swallowing without a valid excuse. So what can be what can uh, be a valid excuse for tasting food or chewing onto food, right? As for the first, to taste the food. If someone has a, uh, uh, an angry husband, right? If a woman has an angry husband and the chili and the spices and the, and, and the, the salt is not correct, there's going to be problems, then it's fine for that woman to taste her food on her tongue without swallowing during the Ramadan. Is that clear? Taste without swallowing. Only if she knows that she is going to make a severe fuss out of it. Like Shaykh Ahmad Didat, Rahmatullah Ali used to say, if there are too many chilies in the samosas, we say talaq, talaq, talaq. People should be patient, it's only food. Is that clear? That's one. And as for chewing food, if a mother has a young baby who she is feeding and needs to chew the food for that young baby, it's fine. If there is no one else to chew that food, someone, if there is no one else who is not fasting, right, then that, the mother can chew the food and give it to the baby. Again, that should not be done in public. Is that correct? Likewise, if someone uh, kisses their spouse during Ramadan, this is fine so long as they are secure that it will not continue to something else. The, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ say that the Prophet ﷺ used to kiss us whilst he was fasting. But Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, and which of you is like the Prophet ﷺ in being able to secure himself from that which is beyond? Right? Is that okay? And which of you is like the Prophet ﷺ in being able to secure 
yourself from that which is beyond you. You have to leave it. Are you leaving? Sometimes we feel overconfident about ourselves. This is what Sayyidina Aisha is trying to say. Sayyidina Aisha narrated that the Prophet would kiss his blessed wife in Ramadan. Would kiss his blessed wife in Ramadan. Because he was secure of that which was beyond him. And Sayyidina Aisha, when after mentioned this narration, she said, Which of you is like the Prophet? I.e., don't be overconfident about yourselves. Right? Often I have young people come to me and say, I don't need to get married. They are overconfident. You know the Prophet ﷺ, he said to young people, Ya Ma'ashar al-Shabaab, any one of you who is able to get married, then you should get married. Is that clear? People shouldn't be overconfident. Because when people are overconfident, that's when they end up falling into haram. We should be truthful with our human natures. Truthful with our human natures. Is that clear? So those are those four categories dealt with. Next, we'll speak about things that are recommended during fasting. Number one, to have sahih, to have suhoor. The Prophet said, fa'inna fi suhuri baraka. The Prophet said, have suhoor, have sahih, for in the sahih meal there is baraka. There is baraka for what? There is barakah that keeps you going for the rest of the day. The food of sahih that you eat, Allah blesses that such that you can uh, be strong and healthy for the rest of the day on the, on the food of sahih. Even if you have a glass of water, even if you have some dates, is that clear? One of the scholars mentions, I think it was Imam Abdul Jawzi, he has a book known as uh, Idiots and Fools. He has a book known as Idiots and Fools. And Shaykh Hamza says that even our jokes, we have chains of narration for them. Right? And uh, I think it was in there that Imam Abdul Jawzi mentions that a pious, righteous man was saying to some lay people that, you know, I stand up at night and I pray the Hajjud, I wake up at, say, 2 o'clock and I perform wudu and I stand up to pray. And uh, he was saying this to encourage others to do the same. And one Bedouin, right, someone who lives in the desert, he said to the Sheikh, yeah, I stand up at night too. I go urinate and go back to sleep. <laughs> so waking up at Sehli time, Sehli time is a very blessed time. People should try their utmost, even though the timings are quite irregular in these days, should try to get to sleep after Tarawih. Inshallah, we're going to have short Tarawihs at the academy. So come along. We'll be done in about 20 minutes. Inshallah. Is that okay? Hafiz Usman, don't prolong for the people, okay? Good. We'll be standing there, we'll be cursing you from behind. Why is this guy taking so long? Okay, number two. To delay sahih right up until before Fajr time. Which means what? Don't have your sahih before you go to sleep. Right? Don't have your sahih before you go to sleep. But if you fear that you're not going to get before sahih before sahih time, then have your sahih. Especially in these days. Especially in these days. Is that okay? But rather it's recommended to delay your sahih up till uh, right before Fajr time. Is that clear? And finally, number three. To hasten and hurry in breaking one's fast. Hasten and hurry in making iftari. So delay the sahri right before Fajr time, and when it's Maghrib time, to open the fast straight away and not to delay it then. And when you say open the fast, it means open the fast with a date or with water. That means opening the fast. Uh, opening the fast doesn't mean to have your enormous meal such that you miss Maghrib and Isha time comes in. Is that okay? My advice to people is is that people open their fast with dates and water and pray their maghrib first and then sit for food. 
Because you know when you sit for that for food at that enormous table, you have so many varieties of food that you'll continue eating. Maghrib time will end and Isha time will come in and you'll still be eating. Is that clear? So those are recommended acts during the month of Ramadan. Now, as we mentioned earlier, what if someone is not fasting during the month of Ramadan? Or what if someone breaks their fast intentionally or unintentionally during Ramadan? Sorry, intentionally breaks their fast during Ramadan or breaks their fast uh, with that which they do not need an expiation but uh, nevertheless breaks their fast. What do they do? So people who are not fasting in Ramadan or people who break their fast during Ramadan, number one, they must not eat or drink in front of anyone else. Is that fair? Those who break their fast during Ramadan intentionally should not eat or drink full stop. Is that fair? For the rest of the day. Uh, whereas uh, someone, a woman who is not fasting due to excuse or an elderly person who is not fasting due to health, they can eat but they should eat in privacy and they should only eat if it's absolutely essential for their body. Is that clear? Okay. Next, there are certain people who are exempt from fasting. Certain people who are exempt from fasting. Number one, someone who is ill, severely ill, remember what we mentioned, not a tiny migraine or a headache or a tummy upset, this is not uh, acceptable. Someone who is severely ill or someone who feels that their illness will increase. So someone who is on uh, high medication, lots of drugs during the day, the drugs that they get from the pharmacy, right? Right? Someone who is on high medications during the day, uh, they fear that if they miss out on these drugs or, uh, or the doctor say, like, you can't fast. Right? You have stage 4 of diabetes or something. Right? So this person is exempt from fasting during Ramadan. If they are a person whose health gets better at another stage, then they should make up those fasts. Uh, number two, a woman who is pregnant, and the doctors have uh, advised her not to fast, then she shouldn't fast. But if she feels, or the doctors, if she, if she knows through experience that if she fasts, it won't harm her or the child, then she can fast. But if the doctors say don't fast, she shouldn't be extra pious and don't fast. She should listen to the advice of the doctor. Likewise, a nursing woman, a mother who is giving milk, uh, uh, breastfeeding her child, again, if she feels that the milk will lessen, then she shouldn't fast. Is that clear? Why? What's the rule here? The rule here, the maxim of Islam here is that the حقوق العباد مقدم على حقوق الله تعالى that the rights of human beings come before the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I.e. the rights that we have towards each other, they come before the rights that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? So a mother is responsible for her infant child that this baby child takes from her milk, right? If she goes and fulfills Allah's right, which means that her right towards her baby child is not fulfilled, then she should not fulfill Allah's right. Why? Because Allah is most generous and most forgiving and He will overlook that and forgive that. Whereas human beings are not forgiving. Is that clear? Yeah? Next. Someone who, who during the fast of Ramadan for example, in Arabia, or in extremely hot countries, in times like this, when the fasts are in summer and extremely long, if someone fears death 
due to hunger or thirst, they are also exempt of fasting then, and make, they should make up their fast in cooler days. Exactly. They are exempt from fasting in Ramadan, they should make up their fast in cooler days, but again, they should stick to the adab of Ramadan and not eat and drink in public. And if they need to drink, they should hide away and drink. Is that clear? And finally, a traveler who feels that it will be harmful for him if he fasts during Ramadan, then he is exempt from fasting in Ramadan and is allowed to make up those fasts out of Ramadan. But if he feels that if I can make up these fasts in Ramadan, then that will be better for him. Is that clear? When making up fasts, so someone who was severely ill in Ramadan and could not fast, someone who thought by the doctor's advice that their illness will increase in Ramadan if they fast, so they did not fast then in Ramadan. A pregnant woman or a nursing woman in Ramadan who did not fast. Someone who feared death due to hunger and thirst and did not fast. And a traveler who did not fast in Ramadan when all of these types of people make up their fasts after Ramadan, they do not have to make them up consecutively. Right? If they miss 10 fasts or 15 fasts, they don't have to make them up one after the other. They can separate them uh, as, as long as they want. Is that fair? But the scholars have said it is best that those fasts are made up before the next Ramadan comes in. It's best. That's the recommended way of making them up. That before the next Ramadan comes in, the previous Ramadan is clear. Is that clear? What about someone who is extremely elderly and can't fast at all? They can't fast in Ramadan, they can't fast out of Ramadan due to their frailness, weakness of their body. Then that such a person should pay fidya for every single day. And what's fidya? To pay half a sa of wheat for each day in charity or its monetary or its monetary amount so either they give out half a sa of wheat and half a sa is a, a measurement and how much the scholars have uh, said that's the same as sadaqa bin fitr two pound fifty or three pounds right and if you have more then you should give more Right? So elderly people who cannot fast in Ramadan or out of Ramadan, they pay fidya. Is that clear? They pay fidya uh, for each day, two pound fifty or three pound. Is that clear? But someone who cannot only fast in the month of Ramadan, but can fast later on, there is no fidya for them. They must fast later on. Is that clear? So like a pregnant woman, she must fast later on. A nursing woman, she must fast later on. Uh, a traveler must fast later on. Someone who feared death due to hunger and thirst must fast later on. Likewise, an ill person uh, who becomes healthy later on must fast later on. Someone who feared increasement in their illness if they fasted in the days of Ramadan, there is no fear for them, they must fast later on. Is that clear? Okay. Usually, the next chapter that the scholars speak about uh, after now is about i'tikaf. Is about i'tikaf in the last ten days of Ramadan. So, i'tikaf in the last ten days of Ramadan is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it's known as sunnah kifaya. What does sunnah kifaya mean? Sunnah kifaya means that if a single individual fulfills this in a single locality then uh, that person has lifted the responsibility from everyone else. Everyone doesn't have to sit it, but at least one person has to sit i'tikaf. And if one person, at least one person does not sit i'tikaf, then all of that locality will be blameworthy in missing out a collective sunnah. Is that clear? And i'tikaf is made in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Uh, and i'tikaf is retreat. It's a, a spiritual retreat 
And the Prophet ﷺ would strike a tent in his blessed masjid in which he would stay, a tiny tent in which he would stay to make retreat and recite the Quran al kareem and make worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there. And ladies are also allowed to make a women are also allowed to make a adhikaf in their home. Right? Where do they make a adhikaf in their homes? Uh, in the place or in the room where they need, normally pray their five daily prayers. Which means what? That there should be a specific area in the houses of Muslims where people pray. And that area is designated as the prayer area. We have guest rooms, we have dining rooms, we have sitting rooms. We should also have a prayer room. Is that clear? And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would have designated areas in their homes for prayer. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would invite the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to their homes. And in that invitation, they would say, Ya Rasulullah, we would like you to pray in this specific place in our homes so that we can take that particular place as our musalla, our place of prayer uh, for two reasons. We'll make that as our designated place of prayer, number one. And number two, we will read the blessings of your presence in that prayer place. Exactly. So women who want to make i'tikaf, uh, of course, women who don't have other responsibilities in the home, women who have uh, others who can take their responsibilities in their home and they have the permission of uh, their parents or their husbands, can make a tikaf likewise for 10 days in that specific place and sit and uh, recite the Quran uh, and make worship in that designated area. Right? People have to be careful. Nowadays, a tikaf has become a joke. When people go in with their laptops and their mobile phones and they roam across the world while sitting in Atikaf. This shouldn't be. Atikaf is a spiritual retreat, right? That you don't see the world around you and all you see is the Quran and worship and ibadah. Right? You know the in the early nations, the monks, the Christian monks would go and sit in the minarets and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for months, for years. We don't have that in Islam. We don't have Rahbaniya. But what we do have is I'tikaf for 10 days. Is that clear? Now, imagine how blessed this I'tikaf must be that the Prophet وسلم, is leaving his family, his relatives, his friends, his companions, and secluding himself and isolating himself for 10 days. And he did not do this sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his entire life except at the beginning when he went into the cave of Hira and in the month of Ramadan. Other than this, he never uh, isolated himself from the Muslims.